Welcome back everyone and you will see it is a PowerPoint with a black background which means we are thinking about thinking and today we are going to think about Hofstede's cultural dimensions theory and this topic came up because we were in the sensory analysis class talking about the idea of setting up focus groups and I was thinking about the cultural dynamics of focus groups. I was also working with some different teams over the past week and thinking about the cultural dynamics that were going on within the teams and why some teams were working really well together and other teams were having a bit of friction. And the one of the great things about being at Niagara College is that we have such an amazing diversity of students coming from pretty much every country in the world. And that reflects on the cultural di dimensions of all of these people coming together. Hofstede was a Dutch scientist who back in the 1960s did a lot of work researching organizational theory um, within IBM and their European division. The fact that they had scientists coming together, computer scientists from all over the world to work together meant that he wanted to understand how these teams functioned and what were some of the opportunities for uh, getting these teams to function together really, really well. So. At the end of this video, you will be able to define Geert Hofstede's six, six cultural dimensions. You'll describe how the original theory was designed to compare national cultures, but has since been advanced and modified to describe organizations and their cultural dynamics. And you'll reflect on your own cultural dimensions and those of your coworkers to identify where cohesiveness or friction in your teams may be occurring and inevitably be able to problem solve so that you can get on with your work and do it as effectively as possible. So, Geert Hofstede was a Dutch um, behavioral scientist, and he, uh, as I mentioned before, he first studied engineering and worked with IBM's European division, where he was um, overseeing teams and wanting to understand how the cultural dynamics of those teams helped for effective teamwork. And he returned to uh, research his PhD in the Netherlands and advanced his theories in um, cultural dynamics as part of his work. Uh, after he uh, completed his PhD, he uh, did a lot of international consulting on organizational dynamics. And you know that I have a fondness, despite the fact that this is a channel about food science, I have a fondness for understanding the human dynamics of systems. Because um, when we understand how humans work together and learn, we are able to get our best work done. and. Obviously, I want you to be the best food scientist you possibly can be. So let's think about thinking and let's think about some of these cultural dynamics and jump right in. So the first one was the power distance index. And in with, within different organizations, sometimes the leaders are separate and set aside from the rest of the organization and they're treated as better than others. And in many cultures and many organizations, that established hierarchy is normal and you wouldn't see a line worker, for example, going and talking to the president of a company in these sorts of organizations. But then equally, you have other organizations where those um, cultural dynamics are more egalitarian, where people are treated as equals within the, within the organization. And that distribution of power and communication is not quite um, separate from one another. I, I use these images. I have a picture of the... Uh, Queen Elizabeth II, the Queen of, of England and the uh, Commonwealth countries there, and you could never imagine her going grocery shopping like the second image which I have. It, it's a picture of Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor, going grocery shopping. And the fact that she sees herself as a normal person who does normal person things like going grocery shopping, uh, I don't ever imagine that Queen Elizabeth would go grocery shopping. Um, but that's, that's a, a, a normative aspect of how each of these leaders see their role and function. That Angela Merkel sees her role as a leader as a person who acts like a standard person, does normal things, and builds a sense of empathy. There are organizations where hierarchy is a useful thing. For example, in the military, having clear lines of communication that you don't just go and talk straight to the the 
the uh, head of the military, you go through your normal chain of command to communicate about issues and communicate about uh, different activities that need to be occurring. So it's not, again, I want to reinforce this, it's not that one is better than another, it's just that one may dominate within a certain organization and other people may have different expectations of how organizations should work. You'll start to hone in on, well, how do we how do we solve this? Well, part of it is just communicating clearly about cultural expectations within organizations and communicating about how you would like people to communicate with one another. Here's another one, individualism versus collectivism. And for my images here, I've got a picture of Clint Eastwood as a cowboy and that rugged individualism um, espoused in the, the cowboy culture versus a team. And I've got the German, uh, the German football league there. Individualism leads itself to um, the fact that people have loose ties to groups and less loyalty per, per se. You see less collaboration, but in many cases, individualism allows exceptionality that if, if people are individuals, they can go and pursue their interests to the best of their ability and are able to achieve a lot by being individual and not tied down to a team. Whereas in collectivism, that's where you have a focus on community and collaborative approaches. The challenge is that in collectivism, there's often um, less confrontation and there's a, there's a social norm where if a problem comes up, you have to go about and build a consensus on solving that problem. And as such, problem solving can become slower within teams and collectivism because you have to have that sense of everyone comes along for the comes along for the ride. And if we've got people who are uh, not, in, not wanting to compromise within the decision making process, it can slow things down. But in the case of individualism, you do not have necessarily the power of an entire community behind you when you have those big ideas to be able to pursue them. So again, again, no judgment call on one being better than the other, but you often see these different behaviors in teams or, <laughs> or in teams that aren't very cohesive because people are exhibiting different um, aspects of the spectrum. Oh, here's another one. Uncertainty avoidance, and we've talked about uh, this in other slideshows, but in some cases, cultures will prefer to work in structures where everything is set in rules and regulations, where you have clear rubrics or clear expectations of exactly what you are supposed to do and how you're supposed to do it. Think of different workplaces where you've had to punch in at a certain time and you have to punch out at a certain time versus organizations where you can show up when you want to as long as you meet your outcomes uh, and deliverables that you have for any any time period. So in, in some organizations, you have that preference for rules, regulations, and operating procedures. And then in other cases, you want to have a lot of flexibility and adapt with uncertainty and embrace innovation and change quite flexibly. And again, in any organization, you need a balance of both. That if you are just stuck to rules and regulations, you are not going to be able to change and uh, take advantage of new opportunities and uh, create new ideas and new, new systems. But if you don't have any systems, then people will just go all over the place and do all sorts of crazy things and not necessarily have as much productivity as they could. So again, a balance between the two. And you will often see this within different individuals too, that some people just love the creative experience and other people really like having structure and having instructions and having definition. And both, both of those people can thrive really, really well when in the right system. Well, this one, masculinity versus femininity. And again, this is not men versus women, but the idea of masculine dominant cultures, they have a very particular leadership structure. And that's where um, Hofstede's concept was that in masculine dominant cultures, you tend to see a lot of focus on personal achievement. So I won this award or I got this um sales contract or I invented this product versus the team-based approach. You see a lot of heroism, you see assertiveness, and you see a lot of um, desire for material gain so that um, people are after better jobs and better positions. 
Feminine inclusive cultures show higher level of women's participation and leadership. You see a lot more focus on cooperation, on teamwork, on focusing on the quality of life for people in the workforce. And you see more emphasis on equity and inclusion, that everyone has a role to play in the workforce and we are not going to leave people behind. Um, and again, it's not to say that there's a judgment call against one or the other, but uh, historically in North America, it has been a masculine dominant culture. And we are now seeing a bit more swing towards feminine inclusive culture where women have a lot more um, opportunity for participation. But we, we see many of these feminine inclusive values and they have been historical and not just, not just espoused by women, but espoused by many other um, aspects of uh, industrial society. For example, uh, many of the inclusive cultures uh, reflect on union um, organization, where you see unions out advocating for cooperation, teamwork, equity, and inclusion of people within the workforce. And that's not uh, an expression of femininity, that's an expression of organization and the use of union and solidarity-based movements to have that. What else do we have here? In different organizations, you can have long-term or short-term orientation. And again, not a judgment call, but long-term uh, or long-term oriented organizations have a lot of focus on planning and future focus and innovation within their mindset. And that, that long-term focus allows for um, flexibility and uh, preparation for the changes that are going to occur in the future. Short-term focus means that there's a lot of respect for history and traditions and the aspect of retaining the status quo because it's stable, because it provides a sense of comfort for those who are participating within the organization. And again, I want to stress this, there's not a judgment call to say one is better than the other. That said, um, in a lot of Hofstede's work, he identified that companies and organizations that had a, a, a good balance towards long-term focus tended to have a better um, sustainability within their organization because they had they had a sense of preparedness. They, they were building out risk-based models because they were anticipating all of the different shocks that may be occurring in the future. And uh, long-term orientation doesn't necessarily mean that you're always just out there dreaming of wonderful things that are going to come your way. It also means that you have a risk-oriented mindset, that you're anticipating potential shocks to the system. On this one, we are talking about indulgence versus restraint. And in this section, this is where you're allowing people to engage in personal desires versus restraining personal expression for the cultural norm. And um, oftentimes this is expressed as spending practices. So, for example, indulgence it would be expressed as being willing to spend money to enjoy life in the short term and take on debt for personal gain. Um, in other cases, it's expressed as a way of uh, incorporating uh, human expression and the willingness to um, go and express yourself through arts and culture and um, dance and music versus um, having a much more subdued approach to personal expression. So within organizations, there are times where you do need to spend, but is it done in a way that's just for short-term gain or is it done strategically for um, the growth of the organization? And likewise, there are organizations that don't spend at all and they're too frugal and therefore you do not have gains within that organization. So, the thing is, uh, Hofstede's theory was developed in the 1960s, and there have been a whole bunch of different additional uh, research theories uh, since then, but there are some uh, additional spectrums that have been postulated using that same aspect that within organizations, you could have organizations that are process-oriented versus results-oriented. So often within the food industry, you'll have very process-oriented facilities where you have um, operating procedures, you have very clear expectations. And in more of the uh, other types of industries, you will be very focused on results orientation. And it doesn't really matter what procedure you take as long as you get the outcome. 
the education sector is often like that. There are organizations that are very employee oriented versus job oriented. And um, how about parochial versus professional? A parochial would imply that you have very established um, pathways and lines that people get. Uh, I think of uh, certain organizations where you get that job because you're your father or your mother worked at that organization and therefore you got that job versus professional in that it's based off of um, your own academic and um, experiential merit that you would receive that opportunity. In some organizations, there's open versus closed systems. And again, that aspect of how much communication is, is going on and how much transparency about operations and activities versus in some organizations you have no idea what your colleagues are doing and and again in some cases that's an incredibly important aspect if you're working in security or in finance you might want to have a much more closed system in some organizations again loose control versus tight control uh, many managers want to have extremely high level of oversight over what each of their workers is doing and in some cases that allows for extremely fine tailored performance and in other cases uh, that level of micromanaging and tight control um, reduces the amount of self-esteem within the workers. And last but not least pragmatic and normative. Uh, the idea being that in a normative um, organization you have very clear expectations and in other cases you're very pragmatic you want to have uh, it's it's almost sort of uh, linked to that outcomes base that you you're very um, matter of fact in how you want to get things done. So just to, uh, to wrap this up, take some time and, with, and think about the teams that you work on. This is a team that we had uh, a couple of years ago in one of the innovation classes and we were working on a project together. And finally, there's a picture of me in one of these slides. Um, but think of some of the teams that you've worked on and think about those different cultural dynamics that could be occurring within the team. How do you find that common ground? I know that within many of the teams that I'm coaching and uh, teaching, I will try and set very clear and unified goals. I know that many of the students laugh and say, you are such a slave to rubrics, Amy, but there's a reason for that. When I set up different projects or different activities for the students, I want to have very clear expectations and communicate that very clearly so that then when when uh, student teams come in and say, you know what, we're, we're having difficulty dealing with this. I can go back and say, well, here's your goal. How are you getting to that goal? And when that team is able to clearly come in and say, yeah, we've all got the exact same goal, then they are much more quick to find compromises. Whereas if the, the goal within that organization or within that team is not clearly defined, it's so easy for the level of interpersonal conflict to... Um, come into play. The other piece of the puzzle is that having clear communications norms within organizations helps, um, it helps with the ability to quickly problem solve. I know that when I uh, go into classes for the first time, I often say to them, well, here's my phone number, here's my email, and here are the times that I'll be responding to my phone and my email. And people laugh and say, well, isn't that just normal? And I'm like, um, not necessarily. One, we have students sometimes participating in online learning that are in completely different time zones. And in other cases, people may have been so used to working night shifts or working odd hours, or they get a sense of comfort that, hey, you know what, um, Amy's awesome and it, it's two in the morning and this assignment's due tomorrow. I'll just text her now. <laughs> By having those clear expectations about what I can and can't do within my teams, then I'm able to clearly communicate back and say, hey, my friend, you text me at two in the morning and I'm not answering you. Or I, or I at least can I, can I can walk in with my head held high, having not answered at two in the morning and responding at nine in the morning saying, you know what, my friend, I clearly stated, I'll text you between these normal business hours and I was asleep and I did not want to respond. <laughs> Having clear expectations about how you communicate with one another allows for you to quickly problem solve. So take some time and reflect on your own teams and your own uh, uh, different cultural values that you have. 
perhaps uh, the cultural values that you're expressing are ones within your own family or within a uh, work team or you could you could reflect on the the original intent of Hofstede's values which were looking at the different cultural dynamics of different countries or different regions of of um, the world main thing is keep on learning keep on thinking about thinking and you will always succeed when you are thinking about thinking <laughs> Take care and we will talk to you again real soon.